Okay, doctor, we're on live now. Buenas tardes a todos y continuando con la última ponencia del día de hoy, eh, a nombre del doctor embajador este, Jorge Herrera Ramos, presidente del World Congress de World Neurosurgery in Your Fingertips, embajador de la paz de la UNESCO, a quien agradecemos la organización de este magno evento, así como a la doctora Deyanira Capi Casillas, quien es presidenta del capítulo estudiantil del Instituto Politécnico Nacional, al doctor Salim Aldraouf, presidente de la Walter E. Neurosurgical Society, al doctor Babak Katev, presidente de la Society of Brain Mapping and Therapeutics y a Brain Mapping Foundation. Todos ellos vicepresidentes del comité organizador y al doctor Parmenides Guadarrama Ortiz, director del Centro Especializado en Neurocirugía y Neurociencias México, quien es nuestro tutor. Es para mí un honor el día de hoy presentar al doctor José Alfredo Choreño, quien es director del área de investigación del Centro Especializado en Neurociencias y Neurocirugía México, presentándonos el día de hoy el tema llamado Panorama de la Investigación en Neurociencias y Perspectiva desde un Centro de Alto, de alto Performance en Neurocirugía. Muchas gracias. Doctor Salim. Thank you so much, uh, Andre, uh, and your team in Mexico City. Uh, we come to our last day of the talk for tonight. Uh, we have a special guest, Dr. Jose Alberto Correno from uh, Mexico City. He's a, uh, he's a neuroscientist, a researcher, who uh, is from the Specialized Center for Neurology and Neurosurgery Research in Mexico City. And he will give us an overall view of the research activities going on at their uh, respected institution and the concept of research uh, at large in Mexico and the need uh, for further work and uh, people uh, to be involved. So this is great to have you, Dr. Jose Alberto with us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Salin. I really appreciate the invitation to this uh, Congress. And on, the, on behalf of Dr. Guadarrama Ortiz, I, I would like to thank the organizers of this event for having us here this afternoon. Thank you so much for the opportunity. So uh, can you give me a chance to, to share my screen? Uh, there is the chance, doctor. OK. We, we can see your share now. OK, so let's get started. Uh, uh, again, hey, hello to everyone who is joining this conference. And I was saying, uh, I am giving this talk on behalf of Dr. Guadarrama Ortiz, who is the general director of our center here in Mexico City. And this talk is mainly aimed to provide a, a broad overview of what is the current state of, of neuroscience research and neurosurgery research, research in, in our country. And also during the following uh, 40 minutes or so, we are gonna uh, mention what are the main challenge for research in neuroscience in developing countries, not only Mexico, but other developing countries. And also we will mention what are the areas of, of opportunity for neuroscience in, in our country and which could be the, the benefits for, for other researchers to establish collaboration initiatives with us uh, in, order, in order to, to establish more uh, uh, initiatives and international efforts to, to improve the, the field of, of neuroscience and neurosurgery especially in countries like us, uh, ours. Um, finally, um, and the main goal of this talk and uh, most part of this talk is, is, is a focus on, on undergraduate students that are joining this, this talk because we want to provide them uh, with a better picture of what could be the, the, their future if they decide to dedicate their lives to research in neuroscience and neurosurgery and, and what could be the benefits of being scientists. So, um, so first of all, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Guadarrama Ortiz, um, who, who is uh, the, the general director of, of SEM. Um, he's a doctor of medicine by the Faculty of Medicine of the National University of Mexico. And also he's a neurosurgeon from the same institution. He's been assistant researcher of the Laboratory of Chronobiology at the Institute for Cellular Physiology in the National University of Mexico. And he's, he's been uh, certified by the Mexican Co Council of uh, Brain Surgeons 
also he he has a he, he was a fellow in micro neurosurgery in at the institute for neurological science in, in the lab of uh, the oliveira uh, in sao paulo brazil and he is also actually uh, currently a professor of cellular physiology and neurology at three different universities in mexico city and very recently he has been uh, named as a class one member of the national system of researchers which is a very prestigious uh, institution for research in Mexico. Um, and so I, I, as I was not scheduled for this talk, and let me introduce myself a little quick. Uh, I am Dr. Alberto Choreno Parra. Uh, I am a doctor of medicine by the Faculty of Medicine uh, of in the National uh, University of Mexico. I also have a, a Master of Science degree in Biological Science by the National Polytechnic Institute and a PhD in Immunology. I was visiting researcher of the Department of Molecular Microbiology of the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri. And, and currently, besides being the head of the research department of the Specialized Center of Neurosurgery and Neuroscience of Mexico, I am assistant researcher at the Laboratory of Immunobiology and Genetics of the National Institute for Respiratory Diseases in Mexico. So, um, Let's begin this talk uh, telling you that, as you know, uh, one of the most important activities and, and a constant activity during uh, the career of uh, all medical doctors, independently of from which area of medicine uh, they are, uh, is uh, the decision making process. Uh, you know, indeed, uh, we have to take so many decisions on several aspects of the diseases of patients uh, from the diagnosis of their, of their illness. Uh, to the, the man management of their underlying, underlying diseases. So uh, we always are deciding a lot uh, about a lot of things. Uh, for example, we have to decide which is the best uh, diagnostic tool for detecting a particular disease or which, can, which could be the, the best biomarker to predict uh, the clinical outcome of, of our patients uh, after receiving a treatment or after being diagnosed. And also we have to decide which is the best man management for a particular patient, or if these patients could be good candidates for surgical treatment for their diseases. And also if we are gonna do a brain surgery, which could be the best approach uh, for an intracranial lesion, et cetera. So uh, fortunately science is, is, is the answer for many of these uh, questions. and it guides uh, a lot of these decisions that we have to take in the clinical setting. So this is because science generates uh, new knowledge uh, that guides, uh, as I said, our decisions and also it guides our actions through our medical career. And this is called evidence-based medicine and is the basis of current and future medicine, you know? So, <clears throat> um, so then, as I mentioned, this talk is uh, mainly aimed to reinforce the interest of medical students on neurosurgery, obviously because this is a, this is a Congress of neurosurgery, but also on research uh, overall. And I assume that all people that has joined this uh, Congress have a particular interest uh, 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 in neurosurgery, of course, uh, but it, it also means that they are also interested in, in science why? Because these two concepts, neurosurgery and science, cannot be separated from each other, you know? Because both depend on each other. Um, uh, science generates knowledge that is used for neurosurgery. And at the same time, neurosurgery raises questions that have to be answered by, by science. So these two concepts cannot be uh, taken by separate. Um, so uh, if uh, neurosurgeons won't let me uh, lie to you, if you decide to become a neurosurgeon, you are also deciding to get involved in, in science because uh, this is because the complexity of the brain and the nervous system, uh, uh, there is no other way to approach uh, the brain and neurosurgery than by using evidence-based medicine. So as uh, I am going to tell you uh, what are the benefits of being a scientist and how this could greatly impact uh, our vision as medical doctors and, and neurosurgeons. Um, 
Um, first, uh, I would like to bring forward some of the some thoughts uh, from Dr. Perez Tamayo, who was who is a well-known Mexican pathologist and researcher, and who uh, shares some thoughts about about which are the best reasons for being a scientist. So, um, one of uh, one of these reasons that he he wrote in in in, in a book. Uh, was to use better our brains. And this is very curious because as human beings, we are the only animals in the planet that use our brains to understand our own brains, you know? And this is crazy because uh, science makes us use better our brains in order to generate ideas and then use the brain again to test those ideas in order to generate scientific knowledge in, and more interestingly, uh, neurosurgeons have to use their brain to generate and prove ideas on how to cure the brain of other people. So this is very, very crazy and our brain will explode eventually if I continue. So another reason uh, for being a scientist is to talk with other researchers. And this is very important because also part of this talk has the goal of showing the force that uh, we as an institution are doing to improve neurosurgery in our country, but also we would like to establish novel collaborations with other institutions and researchers uh, uh, worldwide. So um, this is really, really great because uh, science allows you to communicate with other researchers and with other neurosurgeons from other parts of the world. And, and, and eventually you, you can establish collaborative efforts uh, that will result in better knowledge and better treatments for patients with neurosurgical conditions, which is something that we really need here in Mexico. And I am sure that other countries for developing countries uh, have the same needs. So this is great because um, several uh, researchers and neurosurgeons from different fields uh, could get together their, their ideas to solve the main questions that remain uh, in neurosurgery. And finally, another interesting reason to be a scientist is to raise the number of scientists in general in, uh, in developing countries, not only in Mexico, but especially in other developing countries, since the, these are the regions uh, that currently are being more impacted by, by different uh, neurological disorders. Uh, and also, I, I, want, I want to highlight uh, which is, which is the... the uh, the benefit of studying neuroscience um, and why to study the human brain. Uh, as researchers and as medical doctors, um, we could, could study whatever organ or tissue we, we want, but um, uh, we could study the heart, we can study the bowel, the lung. But I think that uh, the best organ to be studied is by science is the human brain. And, this is very personally because I think that the human brain is a masterpiece of evolution. And well, I am particularly fascinated by this idea of this uh, organ that is the most, most comple complex um, um, organ known in the, in the universe. You know, it, it's, very, it's very amazing to, to think that uh, the brain is uh, formed by millions and billions of neurons and at the same time, these neurons have trillions of connections between them that make our beliefs and that uh, make us think what we think and also make us be what we are, you know? So this is very great. And uh, uh, another important thing is that there are a lot of questions that remind to be answered about a lot of functions that we don't know and a lot of paths inside the brain that we don't have, haven't explored. So I think this is the reason why you're studying the human brain it's a, it's a good, really good area and it's a frontier in, in, in science overall. Um, however, despite all the advances in the understanding of the function of the brain, as I said, there are several questions that remain to be answered and that are of great importance, especially in the case of those uh, that are related with the origin and the uh, physiology of some mental disorders that we don't understand yet and the mechanisms underlying the, the pathogenesis of dementia, for example, or epi epilepsy, or for instance, 
nonetheless a big reason to study the brain also is because it can get sick and this is and this is very important because it's one of the most important organs in, in our body so we have to look for several strategies to 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 cure this this organ and this is the the part where neurosurgery uh, has a lot of things to offer to science because the advances in neurosurgical techniques and technology and the integration of novel uh, tools for for surgery have greatly improved our capacity to heal uh, several conditions and uh, uh, that were believed to be incurable in the past. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, science is not accessible for, for everyone and, and, and it's not available for all the countries around the world. And this is very sad. In, in particular, uh, developing countries like Mexico, but I am, I am sure that this is a, 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 a applicable to, to a lot of other countries from Latin America or, or Asia. Um, it, these countries are facing conditions that make research not a priority for, the, for government's agendas. Uh, so researchers in low-income in, uh, countries uh, have to face the double of challenges than researchers in well-developed countries uh, to generate uh, scientific knowledge. And it's very hard for, for scientists in, in developing countries to compete with the science that is made in the, in the first world, you know? This is due to, to the scarce financial resources uh, that we have in, in other countries, uh, the poor infrastructure for experimentation and also the poor access to, to novel uh, technologies. Despite this, and importantly, uh, Mexico, and I am sure that other developing countries are doing really well with, despite all these limitations. Is, uh, an important thing is that Mexico has always overcome these, challenge, these challenges. And, and even uh, despite of these, um, uh, limitations uh, despite that Mexico is one of the lowest that with the uh, one of the countries with the lower uh, uh, financial support for science provided by the government indeed Mexico is the third country of Latin America with the highest scientific production despite this uh, low investment in, in research and I think this is in part due to the resilience of public uh, research institution in our country that are the main institutions that are moving forward these this, this fields in, 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 uh, in Mexico. And also thanks to the international collaborators that support Mexican science, scientists too. Um, what, uh, this um, resilience of uh, research in Mexico, in researchers in Mexico, um, I think it's well exemplif exemplified by the, by the growing number of uh, uh, manuscripts and scientific publications that are in the world literature that, and that were written by Mexican researchers. And this is uh, uh, something great because uh, despite the low investment, the number of papers are increasing around the world. And interestingly, most of these uh, publications that, came from, that come from Mexico are from the area of medical research because is there the, the, the field that receives more, more investment. But also um, it's interesting to see that uh, from these uh, medical research papers, a lot of them are, are from the neuroscience field. And in fact, neuroscience is among the three most productive fields in, of Mexican scientists. And also, as I said, uh, I think that this is uh, well related with um, with uh, the support that we also receive from from other uh, countries, and here in this graph, I, I show you uh, uh, to which um, uh, from which uh, countries we receive a lot of support uh, through collaborations. So I think we had also a lot of things to to glad to to, to, to thank to to international uh, collaborators, which uh, pr provide uh, support. Um, in Mexico, despite these uh, good things that I was talking about, uh, there are a few institutions that, that are only dedicated to neuroscience uh, and that lead their research in, in this area uh, uh, with enough infrastructure and resources, resources to, to generate good quality evidence to compete with other groups of researchers in all, in all over the world. 
And here I'll show you some of the public institutions that are dedicated to research in neurology, but also in neurosurgery and neuroscience in general. And one of them is uh, the National Institute for Neurology and Neurosurgery of Mexico, which uh, for years has led the area of, in our country. And it has make, made so many contributions to the knowledge about the epidemiology of several neurological conditions uh, in, in our country. And similarly, the National Institute for Medical Science of Mexico has made also tremendous efforts in order to improve the care of patients with neurological conditions and also to generate research on other molecular uh, on the molecular basis of some of the main disorders that, that affect Mexicans, you know. Um, finally, uh, another institution that I want to mention is the Institute for Neurobiology, which is undoubtedly the main site of generation of scientific knowledge about neuroscience in our country. And there are a lot of other uh, public uh, institutions that all, are, are also doing great efforts. And perhaps I didn't mention it, but I apologize, but um, uh, they are they are also doing great things. Um, um, also, we have a lot of academical associations that only focus on guiding the research and medical care to patients with neurological conditions. And some of these associations also have created scientific journals for the communications of the work and advances made in, in, in our country by Mexican researchers, but also from other parts of Latin America. And these are some examples. Uh, we have the Journal of uh, Archives of Neuroscience uh, from the National Institute for Neurology and Neurosurgery. We also have the uh, um, Journal of Clinical Investigation of the National Institute for Medical Science and Nutrition of Mexico, and also the Journal uh, Mexican Journal of Neuroscience, which is uh, 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 the official communication tool from the Mexican, Ac Mexican Academy of Neurology. So these journals are, are really important for, for the science that is made here in Mexico and also in other parts of Latin America because we can communicate our contributions to the, to the, to the world. Um, despite all these advances, despite all these, these uh, tools and, and resources that, uh, that uh, as I said, are, are are, are scarce, but, but are well used in our country. Uh, um, this is not enough, you know, um, this is not enough to solve all the challenges and, and trouble that uh, the Mexican population has to face uh, currently regarding the burden of several neurological disorders that affect us as a country. And so that's why we need more, more research in neuroscience, but also more research in neurology and neurosurgery because uh, in neurological conditions are, are impacting uh, very greatly uh, the, the, our population. And here I show you the main uh, reasons of the, uh, of the need for more neuroscience in Mexico. Uh, and I, I am, pretty sure that this is also the same situation from for other developing countries. And the main reason, as I told you, is that uh, most countries of the third world have shown a raise in the incidence and prevalence of several neurological disorders during the recent uh, years. In particularly in, case, in the case of Mexico, we know that, uh, for instance, uh, stroke is among the five causes of death in, in our population. And this is perhaps related to the great burden that hypertension and diabetes has in, 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 in Mexicans in, in general. Indeed, Mexico is the second most of this country in the world and one of the main places affected by hypertension and diabetes, which are uh, the main causes of stroke in, 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 in globally. Uh, but let's see this graph uh, more closely um, and uh, let's see how Latin American countries, including Mexico, um, which is um, included in Central Latin American countries, are greatly affected by stroke, but also by other uh, neurological disorders like migraine, like dementia, et cetera. 
And interestingly, there are several neurological conditions that are among the leading cause of disease in Latin America uh, that are not related to stroke. And this includes a spinal cord injury, which is very frequent here in Mexico. Uh, also traumatic brain injury that is it's really well known that a traumatic brain injury impact uh, greatly impact uh, uh, Latin American countries. Brain cancer that uh, has shown a raise in, in, in its incidence in, in developing countries, but also Parkinson's disease, uh, and multiple, multiple scler sclerosis and, 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 other, and other diseases that are also important for, for our populations. So uh, I have to say here that uh, these statistics that show, I showed you are based mainly on international analysis and international data. Uh, uh, and this is a really great problem because our countries, uh, uh, our country lacks of formal national registries on many neurological diseases. So we have to trust in international data. And even when we know that most of these conditions are underreported in Mexico and very few institutions have made efforts to complete the, these gaps in, in our understanding of the burden of neurological diseases in Mexico. One of the main examples is the work that the National Institute for Neurology and Neurosurgery of Mexico has carried out about the incidence and main and clinical characteristics of patients with a stroke, a stroke in our country. In fact, this uh, institute, they uh, have their, their own registry about the stroke and their data show that uh, the incidence of a stroke in Mexico is really high. It's about 232 cases per 100,000 people. Um, and more drastically, in, in, all, in people older than 60 years old, um, the incidence is uh, about 18 cases per 1,000 people. And as I, as I mentioned before, hypertension and diabetes are the main risk factors. And these diseases are uh, have a really uh, important prevalence in, in our country. And ischemic stroke is the most frequent subtype, uh, followed by uh, aneurysmal hemorrhage. Um, the thing in Mexico is that less than 1% of patients with a stroke receive um, uh, thrombolysis, thromb thrombolysis, and but uh, but the thing here is that uh, I, I wanted to show you that uh, we need more efforts to to know better these diseases in, in our country because currently we we mainly what we know is mainly based on on, on, on international databases. Uh, another important uh, disease in in Mexico as well as in other uh, developing countries is brain cancer. And again, there are no formal statistics for brain cancer in Mexico. But what we know from international data is that Mexico is not among the leading countries regarding the incidence of brain cancer. However, this is in, in sharp contrast with uh, what we see daily at the clinical setting because we receive a lot of patients with brain tumor. So again, it is possible that um, the problem of brain cancer in Mexico and in Latin America, maybe on their on the reported. Uh, uh, here, um, uh, there are the data of uh, a historical cohort of patients with brain tumors at the National Institute for Neurology and Neurosurgery of Mexico, in which they, they show that a neuroepithelial, neuroepithelial uh, tumor are the leading cause of brain cancer in, 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 in Mexico City, mainly, uh, followed by meningioma and tumors of the pituitary gland. Uh, and among neuro, neuroepithelial cancer, um, there are several subtypes that are very frequent, uh, especially astrocytomas. And, but the, the frequency of other more rare tumors in, in Mexico is is really unknown. <laughs> uh, summarizing this part of the, the talk, is, is, as you can see, uh, uh, one of uh, the, major, the major necessities to be fulfilled by research in, in, in our country is the generation of knowledge about uh, what is the burden of many neurological disorders in our population. 
And here are least some of them that we see very frequently in the clinical setting every day, but uh, from which we don't have a, enough data or accurate data regarding their incidence and what are the main characteristics of these diseases in our, in our population. And you may wonder why is this important? Uh, first, uh, this is uh, relevant because we have to know what to expect from patients complaining of a particular disease. Because uh, as you know, the clinical manifestations of, uh, of a neurological disorder, uh, uh, especially if it, is, uh, if it has a genetic background, it can vary from one population to another. Also, uh, many neurological disorders have complex underlying uh, 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 etiologies and genetic traits that are differently distributed across several populations with distinct, uh, distinct ancestry, then uh, this is why it is relevant to know which genes are associated with certain clinical manifestations of neurological diseases in Mexico. Because uh, in this way, our diagnostic approaches and treatments for patients suffering from these disorders could be could improve and uh, and and uh, could improve from from what uh, we have now, which is based on literature generated in other uh, countries. And as I mentioned, this lack of information is due to the small number of national registers that we have uh, on neurological conditions. And the main that exists uh, here are the Rename Basque Registry, which is a survey of the incident and main clinical characteristics of stroke patients in different regions of Mexico. Another one is the Registry of the National Institute for Neurolo Neurology and Neurosurgery. And the biggest one is the National Survey of Health and Nutrition. Uh, which, however, has a limitation that uh, this uh, survey is more focused on general diseases and does not provide too much information about uh, neurological disorders. Uh, but also you may wonder what is, uh, what is the origin of this lack of information when there are a lot of hospitals around Mexico and national institutes only dedicated to neurological disorders. Uh, well, as I said before, the main problem is the scarce resources provided by the government to study neurological diseases and also due to the fact that most institutions leading neuroscience in our country are public. And I am not saying that public institutions are bad because in, 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 indeed we have a lot of uh, things to thank to these institutions because they have made great efforts during a lot of years uh, despite the, their limitations. Um, but uh, this is why novel initiatives and effort from private institutions are also needed. Uh, unfortunately, uh, most patients, most uh, patients attending private, private hospitals in Mexico um, uh, do, do not receive the benefit of being um, uh, recruited, to, recruited to clinical trials of uh, research projects. And these uh, hospitals uh, do not contribute too much to, to, to research in neurological disorders in Mexico. Uh, in this context, uh, I, I want to mention that our institution, which is uh, very young, uh, it was founded in 2014, has begun to make several efforts in order to get involved in collaborations and initiatives to improve uh, the field of neurosurgery and also neuroscience in, 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 in the local setting, uh, notably since its, uh, since its foundation, uh, our institution uh, has focused uh, mainly uh, its activities on the development of clinical research projects as well as teaching programs for undergraduates. And despite the short life of our institution, we have started with the right food, I think, because we have uh, obtained very commendable achievements uh, very shortly. So I'm gonna show you uh, what are we doing here in, in, in the Specialized Center of Neurosurgery and Neuroscience of Mexico. And first of all, I want to share that our mission is to provide our patients with uh, uh, high quality medical care, but also we, our mission is to generate novel knowledge and technology to improve the interventions that we provide to patients for healing their problems. And also we have a clear vision that 
uh, is uh, that we want to establish a reference center for the management of neurological condition, but also for research on neuroscience and neurosurgery in Mexico, and, and perhaps also in, in, in internationally. And we plan to do this by means of continuous investigation, education of in undergraduates, and also by establishing a national and international collaborations with other, with other groups. So the second part of this talk is aimed to give you a perspective of what uh, are the strengths of our, our initiative as a novel institution for neurosurgery and what are the uh, what are currently our our goals and which which projects we have going on here in our country. So I would like to start telling you about the volume of patients that uh, attend our center. And I consider that this is one of the uh, of our most important strengths as an institution because, uh, despite being a, a smaller place compared to National Institute, we have a, a really great, uh, a really large affluency of patients, and our numbers are shown here in this slide. And as you can see, we are providing care to a mean of 500 people monthly, and I, I think um, probably other institutions receive more patients around the world, but. Uh, this is too much for a new institution, uh, I think, and we are also performing a great number of surgical interventions too every month. Most of them, uh, uh, about 70% of them are directed to disorders of the spine and the spinal cord, but also we, we treat a lot of intracranial lesions such as tumors, such as aneurysms, etc. Importantly, uh, we are also very focused on the rehabilitation of, of physical, but also cognitive functions of our patients after receiving surgery. Thus, uh, we have an area dedicated only to neurorehabilitation and also to neuropsychological interventions for these patients. Um, and here I show you, show you also which are the main disorders that we treat uh, um, in, in our center. And most of them are neurosurgical problems, but also we see a lot of patients with uh, other neurological uh, disorders that uh, uh, cannot be treated by, by, by surgery. Um, this big volume of patients that uh, we receive uh, every month uh, has allowed us to even treat and see very rare cases. Uh, in fact, uh, at the beginning we were thinking that uh, all the interesting cases uh, were attending only our center uh, by an unexplained reason, but now we, we are like that this is because we, we work uh, way too much. Uh, for instance, we uh, have, have had the, the opportunity to see this case that uh, we recent, recently published uh, of a child with a complete agenesis of the corpus callosum who was outstandingly um, had no cognitive deficit and he was even able to practice high impact sports. And this patient um, is constantly followed at our outpatient clinic and by our neuro 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 psychiatric uh, department, because uh, we want to document the progress of his intelligence performance along his childhood but also we want to detect uh, possible cognitive problems uh, and act timely in order to, to limit their impact on his quality of life. And also these ch children, this child uh, will undergo uh, tractography and other functional imaging studies of the brain in order to reveal which alternative compensatory connections are being recruited inside, this, uh, inside the brain of this patient. Uh, we also have seen several cases of uh, spongiform encephalopathies uh, caused by prion proteins, uh, such as creutzfeldt jakob disease, which is a very rare disorder that mainly characterized by rapidly progressive dementia. And this is very, this is very interesting for us because we have seen many similar cases in, in a very short time period. And currently, the incidence of this problem in Mexico is unknown. And indeed, we took the task of reviewing how many cases of Mexican patients with creutzfeldt jakob disease have been formally reported in the global literature over the last 30 years. And we found that uh, there are only uh, 29 ca cases published. 
and uh, we analyzed uh, their main characteristics and found that the disease affects mainly females and that the most common uh, form, clinical form of, uh, of the disease was sporadic. But also we found two cases of probable familiar disease. And we also uh, found that uh, only the 20% uh, of the cases uh, had a defini definitive diagnosis uh, by analysis of, of brain biopsy or, or autopsy specimens. And this is, this, these were the main clinical features of these patients. And as, I, as you can see in the screen, uh, uh, the, the main symptom is rapidly progressive dementia as is described in the literature. But we also saw uh, a high incidence of, of um, cognitive symptoms and also cerebellar compromise, which, which uh, has not been uh, reported around the world. This was a, 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 an interesting thing about the Mexican population with this disease that a lot of patients show cerebell cerebellar signs. Uh, we also have to highlight that we have approached these patients by, uh, very, by a very complete diagnostic workup that includes uh, novel techniques such as the real-time quacking-induced conversion test, uh, which, uh, which has the highest sensitivity to detect uh, these proteins in the cerebrospinal flood of, of patients. And this is, uh, this is a technique that it has been uh, developed very recently and it uses uh, the principle of the template conversion of normal prion proteins into pathogenic prions. Um, but in this technique, uh, you, you use this, this uh, principle to convert normal prions in vitro into pathogenic prions. And this is detected by fluorescent markers. So we are among the first groups in all Latin America to approach pr prion disorders by novel molecular uh, diagnost diagnostic tools. Another rare ca cases that we have, uh, other rare, rare cases that, that we, we have uh, seen here in our center and that we have published uh, in the literature are very rare histological subtypes of spine, spine uh, tumors, like this case of a mature teratoma that we found that was affecting the cervical spinal, spinal cord of a patient that uh, attended our center due to manifestations of chronic uh, progressive myelopathy. Uh, this case uh, was uh, treated by an anterior posterior approach for stabilization of the spine and also for the research, resection of the, of the tumor throughout a laminotomy. And uh, here in the screen, you are seeing the photographs that were taken during the op operative uh, procedure. And this was a tumor and, and in figure B and C, you can see the tumor and, and D also how it was affecting the, the, the spinal cord. And we confirmed the histopathological diagnosis showing uh, tissues from the three germinal layers, including fat, and you also saw cartilagous tissue in, in, in the tumor and also respiratory epithelium. And interestingly, this was the same case reported in the global literature, as you can see here in this, this table of a mature teratom, uh, a teratoma affecting the, the, the cervical spine. Finally, uh, we have seen other rare associations uh, that were not previously described in the literature, and especially in the in the actual in the current context of the pandemic, we have seen uh, some cases like this one that I am showing here uh, of a patient with a history of a recent COVID-19 disease um, who started four weeks later with uh, paraparesis with urinary retention and bowel constipation. And he saw medical attention at our outpatient clinic and he had a positive test for SARS-CoV-2. And it was interesting that imaging studies revealed no compromise of the lung, but data of chronic uh, compressive cervical myelopathy probably um, 
uh, unmasked or exacerbated by the infection, which was not completely compatible with um, acute uh, transverse myelitis. And this case uh, helps to reinforce the idea that uh, SARS-CoV-2 probably has a neurotropism and, uh, um, and, and this adds evidence of a novel neuro, uh, neurological complication of COVID-19. Also, as part of our work is um, focused on spinal, uh, spinal surgery. Uh, we have uh, been also able to get involved in some studies focused on describing the main clinical uh, features of, of populations that are rarely affected by spinal cord tumors, such as children. And indeed, we have published a res retrospective analysis of Mexican children affected by tumors of the spine. And we hope uh, we found that um, most cases were affecting male patients. Uh, the mean age at onset, at onset of their disease was eight years old. And um, the main uh, clinical finding uh, uh, presented by these patients was uh, motor deficit followed by pain in, in, in the back. Um, also, we, um, we saw that, mo that most uh, cases were intramedullary tumors. Uh, and interestingly, we found that uh, pre primary neuroectodermal tumors were uh, uh, well overrepresented among extradural tumors affecting our core, uh, which is important as nobody else has previously shown a high incidence of this subtype of tumor in, in Latin American children. In fact, these kind of tumors were mostly uh, reported in adolescents or young adults, but uh, there are no reports of their incidence or a high incidence in, in, in children. Um, well, um, this Congress is about neurosurgery, so we also do neurosurgery research. And as I showed you some slides uh, back, uh, one of the main uh, uh, these disorders that we, that we treat at our center is uh, thoracic outlet syndrome that as you know, this is caused by the compression of the brachial plexus at the thoracic outlet. And interestingly, this, uh, this problem has been treated with traditional approaches for years. And uh, despite these approaches have uh, several um, uh, limitations and also high, high rates of, comp of postoperative complications, for instance, uh, this picture shows you the transaxillary approach to the first rib and the anterior scalene muscle. And the problem with this approach is, is that uh, despite being used for many years, um, it has some limitations. For example, uh, the area of uh, uh, um, that is a, a approach is a very dirty area, so many patients a percent uh, wound infection after the surgery. Also, the operative field that uh, this uh, technique provides, it's very, very narrow. So, so there are a lot of risks, risk of complications, especially the, this, this approach has a high rate of, of um, pneumothorax, but also pleural effusion which we think it's, it's not necessary for this kind of, of patients. Another traditional approach is the supraclavicular approach, uh, which is better than the transaxillary approach in terms of, of the lo of lower rates of postoperative complications. But the thing uh, and that patients complain about this, uh, this approach is the, the the, the scar that, uh, that, uh, that reminds after surgery because the skin incision is very, very uh, large, as you can see here. And also during the, uh, your, the approach uh, to the anterior scalene muscle and during the dissection of the fat tissue, uh, you find a lot of uh, cutaneous nerves, such as the supraclavicular nerves that you that can get injured during the surgery and then the patient could have pain in the area after surgery. 
and also uh, during this approach you have to to cut the homoid uh, muscle and there are also, there are uh, several uh, limitations also about the risk of a, a, of a possible injury of the phrenic nerve so in in this context we have modified this uh, technique the, this supraclavicular uh, approach for the scalenectomy by by uh, performing a smaller in skin incision and a different skin incision that starts over the uh, superior border of of the of the clavicle uh, and we go into in in medial uh, direction until the lateral border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and then we turn up another half inch and this is the, the skin is incision and as you can see here is very short and despite being that short uh, we can access the the structures of the thoracic outlet Without any complication, and the good thing about this uh, this approach is that we we don't uh, find the, the the cutaneous nerves during the dissection, and we also uh, uh, do, do not find uh, the homoid muscle. And you can see here that you can perfectly uh, reach the the anterior scalene muscle, and also you can find the the phrenic nerve and the brachial plexus and preserve them very well. So we have made a, a small uh, pilot study in 16 patients uh, that uh, underwent this uh, modified technique. Uh, their main age was 53 years old. And most of them were female, like uh, the literature described. And um, most of them were obese and also were uh, users of uh, tobacco um, and also were consuming alcohol. And uh, the 75 percent of them had uh, symptoms of neurogenic uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, but we also saw uh, a quarter of them that also had uh, evidence of venous compromise. And I, I, here I'm show, showing you. Uh, the main uh, symptoms presented by these patients, the main symptom was uh, uh, decreased muscle strength of the affected limb, but also we saw a lot of uh, arm and shoulder pain in these patients. And importantly, we, we haven't seen too, too, too many complications in, uh, by using this, this approach. Uh, here in this table, we, I showed you how we have only seen one patient that uh, presented with partial phrenic nerve palsy after the surgery, uh, but this patient ha hasn't any respiratory complication uh, caused by this, uh, this uh, palsy. And we wanted to make these results more uh, quantitative, so uh, we perform a questionnaire uh, of the uh, disability of the arm and shoulder um, and we, we compare the scores of the patients before and after the surgery. And as you can see here, uh, all patients uh, reduce their scores after surgery. And the mean reduction in their score was uh, 48 points. And the follow-up follow -up period was uh, 18 months. So this uh, shows that this novel technique is really um, good in, in, in regards to its performance and its benefits for patients. Finally, uh, I will conclude uh, this talk uh, showing you how we have get involved in, in other uh, neurological conditions. And as I was telling you in the first part of this talk, um, uh, there is a uh, scar, scars in, in data about the incidence and clinical manifestations of several disorders. And here we have participated in some studies. For instance, uh, I am showing you, showing you here uh, the results of a study that we perform uh, in patients with uh, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And importantly, we, for the first time, this, this, this describe the, the survival of, this, of these patients in the Mexican population. And, uh, and, you, and as you can see here in this table, uh, we, we saw that the five-year survival in, in our overall cohort was 44 per, 
uh, percent, but we saw also a, a lower survival in patients with an a vulvar onset of their disease compared to patients with spinal onset of, of, of ALS. We also described which were the clinical factors that uh, impacted more the, the survival of these patients. And we showed that age at onset of disease and also age at diagnosis were uh, uh, um, correlated with uh, survival. And as you as, as older as you get uh, diagnosed, uh, the shorter survival you have. Also, uh, we, we saw that um, um, that uh, as earlier you need a, a gastrostomy or, a mecha or mechanical ventilation, the shorter you, you survive. And here we compare the, the, the survival curves of this uh, cohort of patients accordingly to, this, to this, uh, these uh, factors. And again, as you can see here in figure, um, in figure H and figure uh, I, um, uh, as as earlier as you need uh, as earlier as earlier you you need a mechanical ventilation or gastrostomy uh, the poor the poorest survival you have and interestingly in figure K you you can see that uh, we compare the the survival of patients according to the their their uh, levels of cholesterol in the blood and uh, 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 the enrollment. And interestingly, we saw that uh, patients with higher uh, levels of cholesterol had a better survival than those with lower levels of cholesterol, uh, which is re really, really important because it is possible that these patients with high levels of cholesterol can, can, um, can um, compensate for the catabolic, um, catabolic process that is, is going on in, in, in their bodies. And interestingly, we also see a lot of patients with Parkinson's disease at our patient clinic. And um, uh, uh, one of their complaints is not about, one of uh, their main complaints, complaining is not about, um, about motor symptoms, but they complain a lot about non-motor symptoms. Uh, so we, uh, um, we perform a study uh, to see which is the incidence of these non-motor symptoms in, in patients with Parkinson's disease. And here the, you can see that the main clinical characteristics of, of the patients that we recruited to this study. We, we had a, a population of 120 patients enrolled in the study. Most of them were males and most of them, most of them were in in early stages of their disease, according to the Hohen and Jar stage uh, system. And here I'll show you in figure A, B, and C, uh, how uh, depending on uh, the age at enrollment and age, age at onset of disease, uh, the patient showed a higher number, numbers of non-motor symptoms. And in figure C, you can see also that the longer uh, duration of the disease, the higher number of non-motor symptoms the patients presented. Uh, also, for the first time, we described the temporal uh, dynamics of the presentation of, um, of some of these uh, symptoms. And as you can see here, we described that the earliest uh, symptoms that uh, patients complain about are, about, uh, are cognitive uh, manifestations, uh, cognitive decline, especially of attention and memory functions. But also they complain very early about cardiovascular symptoms uh, due to the this, autonom this autonomy that they present during their disease. And here I show you the same, but by individual symptoms and some of the most uh, earlier earliest uh, symptoms are vomiting, if, um, uh, delusions also, and some of the Late, uh, latest uh, symptoms were related to the sexual function of the patients. Uh, finally, um, uh, I, I, I will close, I will finish this, this talk by talking to you about uh, what we do uh, with regards to the uh, education of, of new uh, medical doctors in our institution. And we have several undergraduate programs uh, here we have an undergraduate medical internship 
uh, uh, that uh, has a duration of one year. We also have some interns in research that uh, are currently uh, involved in, in, in several research projects and we are about opening positions for a master of neuroscience. And we are very proud of these guys because uh, they have published several, several papers in a very short time period. So this is, a, I think this is a strength of our center. And I, I, I would li like also to mention that we have open positions even for international students. So uh, you can join us if you, if you are interested in, in, in being part of our center. And when, uh, with this, I, 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 uh, again, I want to thank to the collaborators of, to the organizers of this uh, event. And uh, I, I am willing to take any question if there's any. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, doctor. Uh, you can stop sharing your screen. So there are a couple of questions of, of some med students and residents. Uh, I will ask the first one. And it's, which do you believe to be the problem for many medical students lose the interest in research despite taking subjects of research methodology or statistics? Uh, that's a really great question, I think. Uh, and this is in fact, uh, uh, one of the main problems uh, I, of some of the uh, education programs for undergraduates in, in research, uh, because they, they lose very easily their, their, their interest in this area of, of medicine. But I think the problem is that because they don't see uh, uh, what is the impact of, of science on, on, their, on their activities as medical doctors. And this is because there are not too, too many opportunities for them to see uh, which is uh, the, what, what, is the, what is the impact of science in, 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 uh, in our, in our activities, activities as medical doctors, but also they cannot see uh, how science impact on the quality of life of patients probably because most of these programs are taken only are taken only at the classroom and they don't see really uh, what is the what is the real real landscape of science in the clinic you know um, but there are a lot of opportunities to see uh, how science impact uh, uh, medicine especially neurosurgery and in fact uh, during the uh, during the last days in this congress congress you have clear, clearly uh, so, uh, saw how how all these uh, great neurosurgeons are doing research or, and how they are moving forward this this field of, of medicine and how they are publishing a lot of papers that guide the 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 the, um, the neurosurgeon in other countries. So that I think the problem is that uh, that the students uh, do not uh, get enough opportunities to see this uh, clinical landscape of, of science so I, I i don't know if i i answered this this question uh, yes, thank you very much another question is how does the system of compilation and statistical data of prevalence in pathologies in mexico work because sometimes there are doctors who go to mexico have noticed it's the numbers bear barely a lot of papers oh um uh, uh, what I understood is that uh, why data from one study to another varies a lot, uh, vary a lot, a lot. So this is probably because, uh, as I as I mentioned, there are no uh, national efforts uh, that could join several institutions to 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 participate in the same study. So everyone is publishing what they see in in their institutions, but nobody has published really. Uh, what is the the complete uh, landscape of 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 some of these disorders in the whole uh, population in, of Mexico? So probably th this is the reason uh, we we ha we we have to do uh, too much work to to join different uh, research groups to to make um, uh, efforts together to to improve our knowledge of, of these conditions. Okay, and the last question is. Where is the area of more advancement and of research in neuroscience in Mexico? 
for a foreign year to decide to do research in Mexico? Oh, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I think we have uh, really good researchers in uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, areas of neuroscience, uh, from neurosurgery to dementia. I think one of the strengths of neuroscience in Mexico is dementia because we have a lot of cohorts around the, around the country and a, 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 a lot of groups that are studying these patients and, and really showing really, group, really good data about especially about what, what are the genetic traits of these uh, forms of cognitive decline in, in the Mexican population. But we also have a really strong uh, groups of, of researchers in ne neuronal function, for example, or neuro neuronal biology, especially at the Institute for Neurobiology of Mexico, which is uh, an, instit an institute of the national University of Mexico. Um, I, I, I think that those are, are the, uh, the, the strongest uh, areas in, in, our, in our country. Um, but uh, there are a lot of institutes in Mexico that uh, dedicate their efforts to, to neuroscience. Uh, and then for instance, in the National Institute for ne Neurology and Neurosurgery, there are several groups working on different aspects of neurological conditions. For example, there are strong groups on, on um, bacterial meningitis, for example, or in, in you know, brain tumors. In, you know, and I think another area that is very strong in Mexico, it's uh, spinal cord surgery, because we see a lot of patients with uh, 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 spine problems. And, and there are several groups that are working very hard on this, on this field. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Jose Alfredo Choriño. Uh, we enjoy very much your presentation and we hope we can collaborate again with you and the Center of Speciality in Neuroscience and Neurosurgery in Mexico. Uh, thank you, I really appreciate the invitation and, and on behalf of Dr. Guadalajara Martiz, I thank uh, the, 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 the organizers and of this uh, great uh, international congress so thank you so much.